Hey everyone, we are back here at Adrabi with another medical student surgery clerkship preparation video. Today we're going to be talking about surgical instruments. Now, this isn't anything you will ever need for your surgery shelf, and I certainly don't recommend spending a ton of time rewatching or memorizing this video. This is just meant to be a big picture overview to help you get oriented to some of the most common surgical instruments you will see in the operating room. When you're first starting your surgery rotation, it's easy to get overwhelmed by all the novel experiences, confusing protocols, I found that it was really difficult to learn the actually important surgical material while I tried to figure out you know, where to stand, where I could hold my hands without contaminating them, and really just everything that was going on around me. This video is meant to help you get a broad familiarization with the common tools you'll encounter in surgery, so there's just one less thing for you to worry about when you finally get a chance to get into the operating room and you can focus on learning the important content. Also, there are some other video resources online that teach surgical instruments, but most of these are designed for surgical texts and are way too in-depth for the needs of a medical student or, honestly, even a surgery resident. In this video, we sacrifice that comprehensiveness in the name of clarity and try to focus on what you are actually likely to encounter. Uh, we also made sure that all the pictures of instruments are accompanied by types out names, so you don't end up like me and think that Maryland, like the state, is a Marilyn, like the women's name, grasper, until well into your surgical residency. Uh, lastly, the American College of Surgeons um, made an excellent PDF that covers much of the material in this video. Uh, we'll link to that in the video description. All right, enough intro. Let's go ahead and get started. So we'll start uh, looking at open instruments or instruments that are used not in laparoscopic surgery. So the first instrument we see here is called an Adson forceps. Uh, I chose this first because it's one, usually one of the first instruments you'll actually get to use as a medical student because we'll use it to help close the, the skin. Uh, it's pretty small forceps, and the key feature here are these teeth that it has on the end. Um, so these teeth let you actually grab the skin with less force, and you cause less crushing damage to the skin when you use these, so that's why they're used. Um, you wouldn't want to use a sort of blunt forceps on the skin, because that would cause some excessive damage. All right, next, um, so for that contrast, we have a Debakey forceps here. This forceps, as you can see, does not have that big tooth on the end the way the AdSense do, so it's more of a blunt forceps. You do not want to use this on the skin. That's excellent for, um, we use this a lot in the abdomen to manipulate bowel or blood vessels or things like that. Um, but once again, the big thing for you to remember is don't grab the skin with this. Uh, another forceps, these are called, depending on your institution and where they get their surgical instruments from, either ferrous or bonny forceps. It's a bit tough to tell, um, but these are essentially just really big, heavy duty versions of tooth forceps. You can see the teeth here and here, and they're used for grabbing the heavy fascia, like when we're suturing closed, the uh, fascia, fascia at the end of an abdominal operation. Um, you'll see a theme here that we talked about adsense. These are kind of a, I would say, kind of small, delicate instrument, and then you have kind of a middle of the road or normal instrument, and then you have the heavy duty version of uh, the ferrous that's used for the fascia. And for a lot of surgical instruments, you'll see that trend where we have essentially the same thing with three different versions because one's for fine work, one's for kind of everyday use, and the other's for really heavy duty stuff. So I'll try to point that out as we go along. All right, so here we have the needle driver. This is what um, we use to hold needles um, and actually do the suturing. Uh, and obviously there's many different kinds depending on what sort of suturing, suturing you're doing. Uh, the key thing for you to know as a medical student is that these look a lot like clamps or hemostats that we'll look at later, but they do have um, a more finer tip and it has some uh, traction on the end of it, so it makes your needle less likely to slip. Um, so while it looks similar to a clamp, you wouldn't want to use that to actually suture. You want to make sure you have a needle driver. So just like we were saying, this is a, a Kelly hemostat. It's kind of your all-purpose clamp um, used for blunt dissection, clamping out vessels. That's actually what hemostat um, stands for. It's used to, can be used to stop bleeding, although we don't use it for that much anymore. Uh, but it looks kind of like a needle driver. Um, it's just, once again, doesn't have those, uh, that coarse kind of friction uh, in the jaws. Uh, here we have a penetrating towel clamp. Um, it looks like this kind of diabolic device with these really sharp kind of pincher looking things at the end. Honestly, these are usually used to hold towels in place um, after we're draping, and you'll often be helping take these off the towels at the end of the case. Uh, so this is a Coger clamp. So this is the big heavy duty version of our clamps. Um, as you can see, it's tough to tell once again, but this is bigger than most of your other clamps. It has these teeth on the ends. So we use this to grab uh, big hardy structures, once again, like the abdominal fascia when we're closing. 
Um, it's frequently just referred to by uh, the name coker as opposed to a coker clamp. These are two other clamps. They're called the Alice and Babcock clamps. Um, the Alice, as you can tell, kind of looks a little bit sharper and more intimidating than this gentle edge of the Babcock. The Babcock's frequently used for things like grabbing onto bow, and Alice's can be used to grab onto really the bow too, or, or pretty much anything else that you need to, to grasp. And now mosquitoes. These are the light, small, delicate versions of clamps. So uh, once again, you can't really tell from this picture, but this is very small and fine. Um, can be used for small vessel dissection or for just using as a quote unquote snap uh, or something that you snap on the end of a suture to help you keep track of it and keep things organized. All right, now some scalpels. So I don't think I really need to describe what a scalpel is. You guys all did um, anatomy in your first two years, but there's you know numbers with these blades. There's really only three blades that we commonly use. Kind of the jack of all trades blade is this 10 blade. Um, it's relatively large. A 15 blade is just a 10 blade in a very small version. And then if you see a blade that looks kind of like a very pointy end, that's probably an 11 blade. Um, different people use these for different, different things. There's not really a definitive trend as to when to use one or the other, although you can probably imagine that you don't want to be making a long sweeping cut with the 11 blade. That's better for like stabbing an abscess. Uh, scissors. Um, you as a medical student will mostly be dealing with the Mayo scissors. That's these scissors over here on the left. As you can see, they've got kind of blunter tips, kind of hardier scissors. Great for cutting sutures, um, cutting heavy duty things. Whereas the Mets and Bombs, often referred to as just Mets over here, are more delicate scissors. They're used for very fine dissection, lysis of adhesions, things like that. And your scrub tech will probably get angry at you if you use these fine scissors to cut suture and, and dull them because these are um, a much finer instrument that's not meant to be used for that purpose. You want to use the heavy scissors or the mayos for something like that. Uh, here's the Bovi uh, or Bovi electric cautery. It's essentially um, a thermal device that uses energy to coagulate and cut through tissues. It usually has two options, one for cut and one for coagulation. Um, and the heat is actually at this metal end here at the end. We'll frequently just refer to this by the first name of Bovi. All right, so here are a couple of different examples of retractors. Unfortunately, you still will probably have to hold and help out by pulling on a few of these as a medical student. Um, here are just Army navies. They're kind of simple, two-sided, relatively straight, relatively small. This is called a Rich or a Richardson retractor. Um, great for pulling into the abdominal wall. And here is an invention that helps out medical students because it's actually a self-retaining retractor. This one's called a wheat lander, but there's a couple options where it actually locks into place and can do retraction for you and save uh, some energy on your arms. And here we have a couple different types of staplers. Um, the reason I included this in here is because I always got confused by these names. There were always these letter combinations. And I was like, you know, what does these possibly stand for? It must be something super complex. Uh, but once you have it explained to you once, I think it's pretty easy to remember. So over here, we have a GIA stapler. It's a linear stapler. It's cutting. That's not really too important for you to remember. Um, GIA just stands for gastrointestinal anastomosis. So this is used a lot in the abdomen when we have to cut out and make connections between different pieces of bowel. Uh, this stapler over here is the EEA stapler. And once again, that mystery combination of letters makes perfect sense when you spell it out. It just stands for end-to-end -end anastomosis. And that's exactly what it's for, making an end-to-end -end anastomosis in two pieces of bowel. We will have to cut this out. And then finally, we have the uh, TA stapler, which just stands for Thorico Abdominal. It's kind of a general purpose stapler. Um, it's this one over here on the right. Uh, it is non-cutting, so they actually have to clamp this down and then cut across it with another instrument. But once again, that's out of your realm as a medical student. Just know that those names are not some weird secret. They actually just stand for pretty much what each stapler does. All right, so that's enough of the open instruments. Now there's just a few laparoscopic instruments that you'll commonly see that might be helpful to be familiar with. So first, you just have graspers. I actually don't have an image of one of these because there's so much variability, but essentially it's just a long stick with a handle on the end and some sort of jaws at the end to grab stuff. 
Um, they vary a lot depending on where you're at. Here is a Maryland, uh, not Maryland as I thought, which is exactly like a grasper. It just has a finer edge. It's got a little bit of a curve. Um, it can be used for some finer dissection, especially in uh, like gallbladder cases or appendectomies or things like that. You'll see people using the Maryland quite a bit. This is the hook cautery. Um, it's just like that Bovi cautery pen that we saw before, but adapted for laparoscopic use. Um, it's got this nice little curve of metal. That's where the heat's used, and it's used for uh, when you want dissection along with electrocautery, once again, frequently in like a lap coli or a lap appy, as far as the cases that you'll be seeing. And then there are laparoscopic versions of staplers. Uh, you can see it kind of mostly resembles the GIA stapler, where it's this long jaw-based uh, device. Um, one thing I wanted to point out here is that there's going to be different colors of staple loads. All that means is that the staples are different um, heights and that they're adapted for different tissues. You can imagine that something like stapling across a blood vessel might need a different size staple than stapling across the really thick stomach. And that's all that the colors mean. Those are just different staple heights. Uh, and then we use bags to remove organs out of the abdomen when we operate laparoscopically that look just like this. Um, usually this doesn't deploy until you stick it in the abdomen, then you stick it in there, open this up, dump the organ inside, pull back out to close, and then pull it back out through the uh, port side, ideally. And then finally, you'll hear us refer to something called energy devices. Um, really, these are just uh, kind of tissue fusion devices. They can seal small blood vessels, cut through uh, most other tissues, just essentially using heat or um, ultrasonic energy, depending on the specific device. But um, they're all kind of used the same way and it's really kind of manufacturers selling points are the big differences between them for your purposes they they all do the same thing all right so that's it for today kind of a whirlwind hopefully i didn't go through fa too fast through any of those things um but it should be a, a quick and efficient overall review of surgical instruments for you uh, please like and share the video if you found it helpful um, and check out our other content let us know in the comments if you have any questions or corrections. Uh, remember, these videos are for educational purposes only, not meant for the diagnosis or management of any diseases. This video was recorded using Edgerafi Studio, bringing multimedia and surgical education one image at a time. Thanks.